Hey everybody, welcome to another M365.video SharePoint short. This is David Warner. Today we're gonna to dive into an introduction on the SharePoint library components. Now, this is a new feature for SharePoint Framework that is in preview in SPFX 1.8 and supposed to go GA in 1.9. These library components are super cool because they allow us to take common functionality that we may be referencing externally or we may be rewriting in every single one of our web parts and extensions and store it in an independently managed component that lives in our SharePoint site but can still be accessed from our web parts and extensions. So in this introductory video, we're going to take a look at exactly what are the SharePoint library components and what challenges do they solve. We're also going to take a look at how we can access the library component functionality within our web parts and our extensions, and we'll take a behind the scenes glimpse at exactly what happens when we create a library component and how it's made available to those web parts and extensions as part of our other development efforts. We'll start by answering what exactly are the SharePoint library components. It is still a SharePoint framework solution that you create using the SharePoint generator, just as you would a web part or an extension. The difference is that the library component is really just meant to supply functionality to these other components like our web parts or extensions. So as we see on the slide, we may want to utilize jQuery or Moment.js or the icon in the middle may represent simply functionality that our organization needs to access or repeatedly use across all of our web parts and our extensions. So these library components can be deployed into our SharePoint tenant and available to all these other SharePoint development assets, such as web parts or extensions. So you may think, why is this needed? What solution does the library components provide or challenge does it solve? Well, let's start out by looking at what challenges would exist without the library components before we dive into what it does provide. Without the library components, if we wanted to access some often or repeatedly used uh, libraries such as jQuery or moment.js, our first option is to bundle it inside our web part or extension. This will certainly ensure that it's always available to our web part. The drawback, as you can see on the right, is that if we were to put this web part onto a page more than once, each copy of the web part is going to include both moment and jQuery. It's not exactly the most performance friendly. Another option is to externally reference our functionality. So as you can see in this slide, on the left we have our web part bundles, but this time you can see they don't include the moment.js or jQuery library. Those are being referenced externally. Now they could be stored in a CDN or SharePoint library or some other sort of storage mechanism. And just like our first option had drawbacks, this option as well has some drawbacks. We're referencing files externally, maybe in a CDN we don't own. We might be storing them in a SharePoint library that someone could inadvertently accidentally delete. And there has been scenarios where these externally referenced libraries do end up getting loaded more than once on the page, and in some cases, disable functionality in your SharePoint solution. So both of these options that we've discussed to include common and reused functionality have potential challenges. The library components, though, are going to help solve that. Let's take a look at the benefits and the challenges that are solved by using these library components. Because the library components are still SharePoint framework solutions, they actually get installed into our SharePoint site collections just like an extension or a web part. This slide is helping us understand that our web parts, which will live on a SharePoint page, which is illustrated in the graphic there on the left, can access that reusable functionality in our library component. Essentially, what we mean is that when we go deploy a library component into SharePoint, it's not going to be loaded on a page unless there's a web part that has been pre-connected to that component to use that functionality. So for example, both of those web parts on the left may use either jQuery or Moment. But if neither of them do, that library component will not get loaded. The other benefit is that if both of those web parts on the SharePoint page on the left were to utilize jQuery from the library component on the right, the library component will only be loaded onto the page once, thereby increasing the performance even though both web parts use it. 
So you can see how amazingly useful these library components are. We may use them just to simply store within our SharePoint site a third-party library, or there may be a collection of functions and methods that we're using that's specific to our organization across multiple web parts. This allows us to ensure that they're stored in one location and managed in one solution. Now that you have a good understanding of what benefits the library components provide, you may be wondering, once you create your library component, you bundle it, package it, and deploy it out to your SharePoint tenant, and then you need to create web parts that consume and utilize that functionality. You may be wondering, how do I make those web parts aware of that library component, and how will it know what functionality is available so that when I bundle and package those web parts, they work successfully? To help answer that question, let's jump into a demo where I'm going to show you exactly how you set up your library so that your web parts are aware of its functionality. Now let me set the stage for this demo. I've already scaffolded out a library component. I'm not going to spend the time showing you how to do that because Microsoft has created some really fantastic documentation on how you can do that. And I'll include links in the blog post on where you can see how to do that yourself. So what you see on the left here is just simply Visual Studio Code open to the library component that I had scaffolded out. On the right top, you'll see a DOS command prompt. It's just simply open to that same folder. And on the bottom right is my global node modules packages. Let's start out by looking at the functionality that's included in our library. It's very simple. Uh, when it scaffolds out, it includes the public name function. It's just simply returning the name that we had given to our function. I included another basic function here called activate library. So when executed, it just simply creates an alert that is going to be opened in the browser. There's really nothing earth shattering going on in this functionality, and it's not even necessarily the important part. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of the functionality that's included. So let's close that. The important part that we want to answer is how do we make our web parts and extensions that we're going to go build aware of those functions that exist in this library? It starts with the package.json. As defined in the setup documentation by Microsoft, we use an npm link command to create a connection between our library components and our web parts and extensions. The name and the version properties of our library are used to create that connection. Now the reason I have up my folder of global node modules is because I wanted to give you a behind the scenes glimpse of what happens when we execute that npm link command. So as defined in the instructions, I'm just going to go ahead into my DOS prompt and I'm going to type npm link. Now before I execute, I just want to say keep an eye on the node modules folder here on the bottom after I select enter. What npm is going to do is create a symbolic link to our locally stored library. You can already see down here on the bottom, it's utilizing the name that's defined in our package.json file to create that symbolic link to the files stored locally. Now that the npm command is complete, we can see here exactly what happened. It created a link between our node modules folder to the locally stored library components folder where all of that code is located. In other words, when we go to create a new web part or extension that needs to access the functionality that lives within this library component, you can see down here on the bottom in our node modules global folder, our library components introduction component now exists as if it's an installed NPM package. Now, when we begin doing our development within our other web parts and extensions that need to access the functions and methods that live within this library component, we can simply do an import like we would any other node module. Of course, the symbolic link created here within our node modules folder is only used during development time of our web parts or extensions. It allows those web parts or extensions to be aware of the functionality available to the library. It won't actually get bundled into our web part or extension. In future videos, I'll show how we can independently package and deploy our library, and then also package and deploy our web parts so that they're aware at runtime that the library exists and can use the functionality. I hope you found this introductory video on library components useful. Definitely keep an eye out for more of my videos on developing and utilizing the library component functionality coming soon. 
I've included some useful links in this slide, which are also available in the blog post. The first is the Microsoft Overview documentation for library components. The second is a written tutorial from Microsoft that shows how to scaffold out a library component and connect a simple web part. Thanks again for watching and be sure to subscribe in YouTube to get alerts for all my future videos.